Hi, I'm Dr. Jerry Jampolsky. I'm an adult and child psychiatrist, and I'm a co-founder of the company that's called Attitudinal Healing International that has a website, ahinternational.org. And we're here today to introduce... Uh, my name is Joe Carey, <coughs> Dr. Joe Carey. Um, I've been involved in uh, attitudinal healing for probably the last 25 years or so. And um, I was very involved at the Center for Attitudinal Healing in Sausalito for many years uh, and wore many hats during that time. Um, I was a facilitator of the Life Threatened Group for probably, gosh, maybe about 15 years or so. Um, also, I was on the board of directors, president of the board of directors for a period of time, where we uh, raised quite a bit of money for our endowment. And, um, and I've been retired from pediatric dentistry for probably about 10 years or so now. And so I volunteer and I'm still very involved with uh, now the International Center for uh, Attitudinal Healing. And um, quite excited about all of the things that have been happening with the International Center for Attitude and Healing. What's your contact with Attitude for Attitude Healing and, uh, and AIDS? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Well, um, I was, many years ago, um, I was in relationship and my partner was diagnosed with AIDS. And at that point in time, um, I had not had the test or didn't know whether I was positive or not. And, uh, and eventually, I did take the test and I was positive and that was in 1984. It was when the test first came out. And uh, really everything in my life at that point in time sort of turned upside down because um, everything that was important to me about a career and advancement and making money and having houses and cars and it just seemed meaningless at that point in time. And uh, it took me quite a few years to really try to, try to get my bearings from all of that. And um, what happened was that I had a copy of The Course of Miracles, which I had dragged around for probably three or four years, maybe even longer. I had them not even in my house, but in my garage. Someone offered me more than they were worth at a garage sale, but somehow I couldn't let go of them. <laughs> So on really sort of when I hit bottom, I thought, you know what, it's like, let me give this thing a shot. And I did, and it was the beginning of really a new life. And so uh, after doing the Course of Miracles, totally on my own, for two years, um, I then realized that I wanted to be of service in some way. Uh, and I sort of looked around for, you know, what was available. and there was the Center for Attitudinal Healing, and it was just this perfect, perfect fit. It was um, sort of just meant to be. And so when I first came to the center... Let me just interrupt for a minute, because the people that are watching this might not understand what Attitudinal Healing is or what a support group is. Can you just share just a little about that? Sure. Um, basically, Attitudinal Healing um, consists of 12 principles. And the principles of attitudinal healing are really a, a, a distillation, which Jerry uh, was instrumental in, uh, in doing. Uh, and it's a great distillation of some very, very profound wisdom. And, uh, and the groups that we do are, can be groups that are specific for people, like many years my my bread and butter was uh, the um, life threatened group, uh, but there was also groups for caregivers. In other words, we would meet and the life threatened people would go into one group, the caregivers would go in another group, um, and then there was spousal bereavement. In other words, people who had lost a loved one would come, you know, to deal with those issues. So there were there were all groups uh, that were dealing with you know, some kind of loss. But then there were other groups that were just for people who were just living their lives and had no 
particular issues, but just wanted to learn about attitudinal healing and how to use the principles to, you know, to enrich their lives. And I think at, at one point in time, the center probably had 28 different groups. Uh, we did family groups, um, like if, if a uh, person in the family were diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, whether it be the mother, the father, or the children, they would come, we would feed them dinner on a Tuesday night, and then we would all break up. Like sometimes I facilitated a parents group, sometimes I'd be with Carolyn Smith, uh, who has uh, been a great co-facilitator uh, that we've worked together for many years. Um, and yeah, so that was basically, you know... Uh, so let's go back to when you were here. A few years after AIDS started, back in 1981, and uh, you must have had some fear at that time. Uh, well, when I, first, when I first came to the center, I did not come as an openly HIV person. Because I was a pediatric dentist, it was very, very sensitive at that point in time because no one really knew specifically how someone got AIDS. It was really before any of the science uh, had, had come to light that, you know, that we're familiar with now. So, uh, so I just came, and really the reason that I came was that was it was very pragmatic. It was like I realized that I probably wasn't going to live as long as I thought I was going to live and that I had better prepare myself for, for the eventuality of dying. So you weren't necessarily in an AIDS group when you first joined? No, okay. no. I came, uh, and did a facilitator training with uh, Sharon Pear Taylor, who is one of the most incredible mentors uh, I've had uh, in attitudinal healing. And uh, yeah, and we facilitated the Life Threatened Group together. And then at some point in time, um, I had stopped working uh, because I was becoming ill, and uh, and then at that point in time, I shared with everybody, uh, you know, the fact that I was HIV positive, and uh, and it came as a shock to many people because I was there every Tuesday, running around, helping uh, facilitate groups. Um, a couple of times a year, we would do a uh, attitudinal healing 101, which was a wonderful three-day retreat at uh, Santa Sabina uh, Retreat Center in uh, San Rafael, California. And it would be a residence program, so people would come and they'd be there for three days. And it was always perfect. The people who showed up just really needed to be there. They really needed to hear the message of attitudinal healing. And it was, it was transformative. It was, you know, by the time we had spent three days together. Um, we were all different. We were, we all had been, uh, you know, totally. Uh, what, do you, what do you remember the kind of social climate at that point in time uh, to the general public about AIDS? Uh, there was a lot of fear and a lot of mis misinformation. I mean, you can kind of share what you yeah. remember about that. Yeah. No, it was it was really you know from. From our perspective, at this point in time, it was like the dark ages. It was people had no idea how it, how it was happening. People were worried whether a waiter in a restaurant serving you could, could you know, transmit the disease to you, uh, whether you could get them by touching someone's hand or, or uh, you know, there was no idea of how it was transmitted. So there was a great deal of fear. and uh, and. You know, there was all these suggestions that once we found out that someone was HIV positive, someone suggested that they actually just be put in an island, someplace to isolate them. Right. So, you know, so there was incredible amount of fear amongst people who were diagnosed that, as being HIV positive because you didn't know what was going to what was going to happen. And uh, and you know, the Center for Attitudinal Healing, um, thirty years ago when Jerry founded the center, um, the word support group wasn't even in our vernacular. Of course, now everybody says, oh, are you going to a support group for this or that? At that point in time, there was nothing. So the center became a place where people who were HIV positive could go and feel safe and not judged uh, by other people um, because that's what attitudinal healing is about. It's about uh, um, you know embracing everyone 
at any given point in time in their in their life, regardless of what they're what they're suffering from. Now, since that time in the early '80s, and now we're here in 2010, uh, there's been a lot of education here in the United States, so uh, people don't feel fearful about being with somebody who has AIDS or is HIV positive. They uh, can you share more about that in terms of yeah. Well, of course, uh, now now we know the science of transmission and. You know, really, the only the only way that one person can transmit AIDS to another person is through is through uh, uh, blood or uh, or uh, sexual contact, and so I mean those are you know very very specific instances. So you know you can't get AIDS from someone by sharing the same toothbrush or the same plate or any of those other things. So it's, yeah, it's, you know, scientifically... So let's emphasize this. You can't get AIDS by kissing someone. You can't get AIDS by uh, eating the same food, uh, being on the same trolley, being in the same theater. It's only, you get it only through sexual encounter. Right. It's really important that everyone listen because in countries like we're in, in Mongolia and other third world countries, uh, they've been recently gotten AIDS, so they're way back when we were in the 80s, so it's important in this little interview that we're doing that people can get a sense from an educational standpoint that uh, uh, we can hug and, and kiss each other <laughs> and not, not be afraid that we're going to get AIDS. This is true. Uh, how old are you now? Uh, I'm 63. Yeah, and I was, uh, and I knew that I had AIDS in 1984, so that's been what about... 27 years or yeah. so. Now, my memory back in the time you got AIDS was not too much was known about it. Most people died. Uh, your thought of being able to live more than a year or two was very minimal. Uh, and uh, the dying process was not very a pleasant one. Uh, today, people are living, as you have, for many, many people are living for 25 years and more. Yeah. And it looks yeah. like you could live till you're 90 or 100. Well, it, it, I think it's become what everybody now calls a manageable disease. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's still difficulties. There are still reactions to drugs. It's you know, it's not a, it's not a walk in the park. But I'm still alive, and many people are still alive, and it's still possible to you know to maintain good health. Um, you know, after after you know many years. Well, it's been my experience. The people that have been involved. Uh, in attitudinal healing and, and working using attitudinal healing as a form of helping them, that they found that when they're in a consciousness of helping other people, they begin to help themselves. You know, the inner peace is what we could determine as health and, and healing is letting go of fear. And, and you've done a lot of service. You've gone to Russia and many different places. Tell us about Russia when you've gone there. Well, uh, and, and they were sort of behind times at that time when you first went there. Well, the thing the thing that comes up for me when you say that is that you know what you know what you always said and what we always said at the center, if you're here to help someone, you're misguided. It's like if you come to the center to volunteer, you're here you're here to heal yourself, and you know that is so. It's like you know whenever whenever I do anything in attitudinal healing, whenever I try to be of service to anyone, it's really about healing myself. Uh, and the opportunity to be there in whatever capacity you know I can for anybody else. But yeah, I've had some incredibly wonderful experiences. I mean, the the experiences here, facilitating groups, um, doing trainings. Um, also, we did high school trainings to you know to watch young children respond uh, to attitudinal healing. Um, yeah, and I was really very privileged to go to uh, Russia and do a six-day training with Carolyn Smith, and also to Kiev, where we did a uh, six-day training at um, at a local hospital there. And uh, the thing that's really so amazing is that attitudinal healing is so universal because it's so simple in many respects, and it really deals with uh, a person-to-person -person, um, communication.
communication and someone just being there for another person and um, yeah, it was quite it was quite amazing. We the the um, experience in Russia. Um, a lot of most of the people we did the seminar with were HIV positive or worked in the HIV uh, field uh, as nurses or uh, practitioners or whatever. And they really didn't have a very good social uh, support structure in terms of social workers and that kind of thing. So what, what they would do is some of these young kids, a lot of them were drug addicts because that was how they uh, uh, became HIV positive. Um, they would then ask them to help other kids, young people who, uh, you know, who were HIV positive get off of drugs or whatever. But these kids didn't know how they got off of drugs or, or you know, why. And so all of a sudden they were trying to lead these other young people uh, out from using, and they were lost. They were really lost in terms of having any tools to really connect with these people. So when we did facilitator training, they were like, they were like shocked that it wasn't their job to fix whoever it was or give them advice or tell them what to do, but it was just there to, there, they were just there to, um, to um, be open to what they were saying, to hear what they were saying, to give them feedback about what they were saying in terms of just repeating what they were saying. So at first they couldn't, they couldn't sort of believe it that this was actually going to work. But then we broke down and we had, we had small groups. And of course, once we started doing the groups and Carolyn and I would be facilitating the groups, uh, they realized how, how people just opened up and shared what was happening with them. And you know, some of the things that people said were, my gosh, I've been here with these people that I never knew before for like four or five days and I'm closer to them than I am to people I've known for my entire life, my family, my mother and exactly. my father. Exactly. Yeah. And, and also, one fellow said was that he, when he spent, uh, he used to see clients and he'd have to see like four or five a day. He said, before I did this kind of work, I unloaded cement bags from a truck. He said, I was more exa exhausted after seeing those three or four cl clients a day than, than unloading truckloads of cement all day because they didn't really know, they didn't have any tools, they didn't have any skills for, for being able to, you know, to support people through difficult processes. Any other kind of peak experiences like in Russia, examples of maybe someone who's kind of got a new awareness or uh, a little story that you might be able to share? Um, yeah, there, there was this, this one fellow, the fellow who talked about the, the, uh, the unloading cement trucks versus, you know, he was, he was so, um, what should I say, and he was very bombastic in his speech, so you, he was, when he spoke, the whole room just echoed when, whenever he spoke, and, uh, and he was very resistant to the whole thing, he was like, he had sort of come, but he wasn't really enrolled in what we were doing, and just sort of looked and was very questioning. And but I tell you, it was like by the end of it, he he just like he did not want us to go. He you know he wanted to be with Carolyn and I the entire time and talking about well, what if they said this and how do you think we could do this and and I know that you know that that we deeply affected that young man's life and this was. All of the people that were involved in the group, uh, you know, were the same. But you know, but you could just tell that that um, that they were so in incredible need of some kind of tools to be able to you know to be with people. Let's imagine for a moment that you were hired as a consultant in the Department of Health or the AIDS Foundation in Mongolia, and uh, they were asking you. But what are the first things you think should happen in this country? There's still a lot of fear there, misinformation. Uh, what suggestions might you give in terms of you're talking to newspaper people as well as uh, professional people uh, to kind of summarize some advice you might think of when you give people based on your experience of so many years not only having AIDS and HIV positive, but to, that you've been involved in helping people? What might you say? 
Well, I think that um, that it's so easy for people to hide if they have HIV. I mean, I think even in our country now, after everything that uh, that we've gone through, uh, you know, there are still some people who are afraid to come out to you know after they're tested. So, so I think that that um, you know I because many years ago I was in that place, I know what that feels like to have a secret, to not be able to tell anyone for fear if you tell someone that there could be repercussions with your family, with your work, with your, you know, whatever it is. And I know that in Mongolia that there's got to be many, many people who are in that situation. And, um, and if we could somehow reach those people and uh, to let them know that they're, that they're not alone, that there's a lot of people who are, you know, who are going through this. Like many times when people come to a life-threatened group and they meet other people that are going through the same thing. I mean, your family can be supportive about something. You know, a doctor can be supportive about something. But when you meet someone who is going through what you're going through or has gone through what you're going through, it's a very, very powerful connection that, uh, you know, that, that people have when they go to a group and they bond because of whatever issue uh, they've been having. And, I, you know, I think, I think in Mongolia, like, you know, like many countries, uh, where this is something that's just uh, starting out and hopefully, you know, if the statistics are correct, there's not, there's not the uh, level of uh, infection and epidemic that there is in, in other countries. Um, but then again, uh, I think one thing that's really important is that all of the new studies are showing uh, that if someone is HIV positive, and they take medications, and their viral load becomes undetectable in their body. That does not mean that it's eradicated from their body, but that they're, they're undetectable. The levels are so low that the blood test cannot detect them, that they can actually not transmit the virus to anyone sexually. So it's so important for people to get tested early, to find out if they're HIV positive, and to, if so, then to start on medications so that so that first of all, it will increase their likelihood of surviving long term. Well, like you say, it's a manageable disease. Today. It is exactly, exactly. It's not a death sentence. No, and and also, I think it's one of the greatest tools of prevention. There was just, as a matter of fact, just two or three months ago, there was a Canadian study, uh, funded by the U.S. and Canada, where they showed a a, a commensurate drop in new infections versus people who who got on medications. And a Swiss study a couple of years ago showed that people who had an undetectable viral load for two years, it was impossible for them to transmit the virus. And, you know, that's not to say that people should not have safe sex or that, you know, that, that, you know, that, that, that that's okay. It's not. But it really points to why people need to find out if they're HIV positive and why they need to get tested. And if there's an atmosphere of fear, it's very counterproductive because people are afraid to get tested. People are afraid to take medications because that will label them as, uh, as someone different and, and someone that's ostracized from the community. One thing we didn't talk about but you alluded to is that uh, before you had AIDS, uh, you were pretty materialistically oriented houses and other kinds of things. Uh, and it seems to me that you've had a spiritual awakening since you've had your disease and that your life and values are different and there's a bit of spiritual awakening. Can you talk about that part of it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just there's that there's that saying that that whoever has the most toys when they die wins. <laughs> and, and I think that, that can be, you know, I, I don't want to say it's an American way of life, but I think I think we're, you know, a, quite a materialistic society. And I was, you know, I grew up in a uh, um, lower class family and it was all about getting a good education, which I did, um, and then going out and making your mark, uh, which I was, you know, which I was well on my way to doing. 
And uh, yeah, and after, you know, when it all seemed like I was going to lose it all, it just seemed like, wow, that was like a lot of effort and not really any, any really deep, satisfying reward. And yeah, and since I've discovered attitudinal healing and um, it's, you know, it's a whole different perspective. It's a, it's much more of a deep, uh, uh, richer inner life and uh, it's so much easier to understand people and, uh, and to not judge them because, you know, I've, I've experienced a lot of what they've experienced and uh, there was, we used to do a, uh, a panel when we did the level one trainings where we would have families who had come to the center who had had uh, experiences that helped them and they would, they would share about things. And so there was one 14-year-old uh, girl. She was there with her mother and her younger sister uh, and her dad had committed suicide. And they were seemingly a very loving family, but he was under a great deal of financial stress, and he was away on a business trip, and he was by himself, and he just, you know, had one dark night in a hotel, and that was it. And so they were they were just devastated, and the mom could really not have was couldn't really support the daughters because she was like devastated. So so they came to the center, and they got involved in, in the children's group, and so I was helped helping moderate the panel and I asked this girl you know what what did you learn you know is life easier for you and I said oh yeah so it's, it's much better now I said well what did you learn and she said well when I walk down the street now and I see someone walking down the street I know that everybody has secrets everybody has things that they don't want people to know about them everybody's afraid that they're going to be judged by someone else she said I, I always thought it was only me and I thought oh my god I didn't learn that until I was about 50, you know, and and it, it's you know it's those kinds of things where you watch these you know, these young people, who you know one of the principals that were students and teachers to each other, and are you kidding? I mean, like just being with that young girl, and watching you know how this tragedy in her family brought her to a level of of spiritual maturity in a very short period of time was you know, was quite amazing. I, many times I was asked to facilitate a person-to-person -person group, which was where people who didn't have any special issues would come and talk about their lives and, you know, try to use the principles of attitudinal healing. And I used to do it, but it was not like my favorite group. And people said, well, but why is the life threatening group, you know, your mainstay, like you're always, the one you always go back to? And that's because those people realized that this is it. In other words, that they had to change, that they had to look at their lives and take account of what they have done and haven't done. And, and it was so amazing to watch people make peace with their families, uh, with their loved ones, uh, you know, make connections. So they think uh, forgiveness comes into oh the focus, right? It's just it's like right phenomenal. Well, they, they start to feel peaceful even in the process of dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to say that that I was diagnosed with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and this was right before the new drugs came out. Um, yeah, like twelve years, thirteen years, something like that. It was like when I stopped working, and um, and so you know I had to go through this horrific chemotherapy lost all of my hair, you know, it was really, it was, you know, it was a terrible, uh, you know, terrible thing. But, uh, but I really had the tools and I was quite peaceful with the fact that I knew I was going to die. And it was sort of like, I felt like I was this, this Olympiad who was going around the track, carrying the torch. And I just like had like one more lap to do and I had made peace with my family. And I was actually, there was like this thing of, I was looking forward to the next adventure, which was going to be what happens after I die. Right. And, uh, and it was quite sweet. It was, uh, you know, giving up all of the struggle about everything. I mean, like I gave my checkbooks to my brother. I told him where everything was. I said, you know, it's like, it's your deal now. You know, I'm like a, 
checking out. And I remember once the, I started taking the drugs and I started getting better, it was like someone came out and says, there's been a change of plans. It's like, we don't know how many laps you have to do. <laughs> you still have to do it. And, and there was almost this thing of like, oh God, it's like, I don't know if I can continue and do that many more laps with grace and dignity, you know. But, uh, but yeah, so, so it was, you know, for me, I really, through doing attitudinal healing, I got the tools so that when I was ready to leave, I thought I was going to be leaving the planet, that I was really okay with it. I was very peaceful. It was, uh, it was very hopeful, uh, you know, that, because I knew that, you know, that there was going to be something afterwards that was going to be, um, you know, and I still know that. So, so that I think it, that's what gives me great peace and, uh, and also the, you know, the, the joy and, and energy to do this kind of work. Anything else you'd like to say before we close off this interview? Uh, no, I think that we pretty much yeah. covered a I, lot of things. I think you've just given a remarkable interview that's going to help maybe thousands of people. Uh, we've been listening to Joe, Dr. Joe Keller uh, share his background as a, as a dentist, uh, his background as a guy who wanted to make it in this world, uh, and coming down with AIDS and thought he's going to die, uh, and uh, allowed himself to have a transformation by helping other people. And uh, the message here for both of us is uh, how important it is to let go of fear in our life, not to make judgments about others and ourselves, and uh, to see a teacher like Joe here, who you can see his energy and his love and his compassion for, for people, and how sometimes we have the wrong priority of, of living in a materialistic world rather than a world of cooperation and compassion and helping others.